Welcome to Gatekeeper Games. My name is John Rott. I am the owner and lead developer of Gatekeeper Games. Today I want to show you a gameplay video of how to play our newest creation, The King's Armory. The King's Armory is a tabletop tower defense game for one to seven players that is full co-op. There are no secret winners. Everybody wins together or everybody loses together. A bit of backstory. There once was a young prince who, during the reign of his father, the king, great peace was brought to the land and the enemy hordes were driven back. The young prince was a wise young man and realized that one day these hordes would return. So when he ascended to the throne after his father had passed, he poured all of the resources for the defense of the kingdom into a very unique train of thought into a unique armory that would be populated strictly by the bravest, strongest, most clever, and most intelligent dwarves and gnomes in all of the kingdom. And he would create wild and eccentric weaponry that would defend the kingdom should they ever be attacked again. He thought to himself, in this way we can save our resources of food for our people. Fewer will have to die on the battlefield because we could trust in our unique equipment and amazing armory creations in order to defend us. And should we ever be attacked, we will call upon our handful of brave heroes and the few hireables that they would be capable of hiring to stand on the battlefield to defend us while we build our equipment and our armory. Short, sweet, and an awful lot of fun. Welcome to the King's Armory. So what you see before you right now is a fully set up map about um, one wave in to the game. What I want to do now is I want to take this off. I want to show you quickly how to do a quick setup of the game and we will get started playing through a five wave game. There are There is a five wave and a seven wave option. We're going to go with the five wave game today, perhaps skipping along to save you a little bit of trouble of watching too much. I'm going to let you watch the entire first wave and the in-between waves phase so that you can see how the monsters are generated, defeated, and how our defenses are built up as a result. Okay, so set up for the King's Armory is a fairly simple process that takes anywhere between realistically 5 to 20 minutes. Why such a range? The reason for the range is because you get to design your own map. Now if you have an idea for a map in mind, it'll take you about 5 minutes. If you haven't thought about that yet, it's going to take you upwards of 20 to decide how exactly you want to do that. We have our double-sided tiles here. I already have them simply arranged for us for quick distribution. They go evenly inside the border, which I have pre-set up for us to save us time. The border has puzzle connectors interlocking the puzzle pieces together so that the map will stay in place. We'll put the rest of these tiles down. So, right here. Put in the last few. Okay. Now we have our map set up. At this point, we want to arrange our hireables. We want to make them nice and neat over here. We've got foot soldiers and archers we want to keep close to us. And then our three supernaturals, our sorcerer, our psionicist and our cleric. Near them, at the top of the monster entrance border piece, we're going to set up our monster tokens. Now we are of course working with our beta prototype here. These are not the finished pieces, so we appreciate your understanding there. What we're working with here are the monster tiles that are color-coded. In the actual game, they will be spinner pieces. The spinner pieces are, um, as can be seen in a couple other games, we borrowed that design. We thought it was very effective and efficient for our game. What it is, it is two circular pieces of cardboard or punch board. And they, the top piece has the illustration of the monster with all of its stats right there. So it uh, all moves with the monster uh, with a little cutout revealing the bottom spinner. The bottom spinner is simply a a wheel of hit points. So as you spin the top spinner, the bottom one reveals the remaining hit points. So we have five levels of monsters that will be color coded in these colors. We have yellow, green, blue, purple, and red for level one, two, three, four, and five monsters. We have a last category of boss monsters. You will experience only one, maybe two boss monsters depending on the scenario you choose to play. 
Here we have our castle gate hit point tracker, which will also be a spinner. We have towers. We'll get to work on those. These are our print and play towers in the game. We hope to have full three-dimensional towers. I will be working with the flat print and play towers strictly today so that from your static angle, the, this tower doesn't get in the way. All right. Um, here we have um, our tokens for what we call BBSSB tokens, Bleed, Burn, Stun, Slow, and Blessing tokens. We have a Monster D20, a Monster D12 for monster selection, and we have four decks of cards. First are the gray stone-colored armory cards. We have green reinforcement cards, because we'll call them from out in the wild, and they'll come and help us. We have equipment cards that will be colored a general bluish teal color. And finally, we have our deck of coin cards. Each of those are welcome to be shuffled. I shuffled before we got started. Down here, we have our list of heroes, each with their own unique D20. We hope to be adding miniatures to the game. If we don't manage to do that, then you're welcome to use your own. But let's hit those goals together and get those miniatures involved, because they will be custom for the game. And that's just about everything for setup. So now that we have a setup, let's talk about objective. The objective of the King's Armory is to keep the castle gate safe through the entire duration of the attacks, which will be five to seven waves. Each wave will come with a certain number of monsters. The last wave will come with one or two boss monsters to add a tremendous level of complication to your life. If you manage to kill the boss monster, you have defended the realm. Kill the boss monster, kill all of his minions on the final wave with at least one single solitary hit point remaining on the castle gate, and you have kept the monsters from breaking into the king's armory. Because if they do break into the king's armory, they will use the armory card against you and use it to destroy king and castle. Bad news. Monsters will enter the board. They will march along the path. You will have static towers that will be placed around the board, depending on where, you, where and when you choose to build them. Each tower can host up to three allies. Allies being a general term for heroes and hireables, all count as allies. Each tower can host three allies, whether they be allies like our ranger, who is on the tower, or Valcor, one of our champion foot soldiers, who would be on the path, would be associated with said tower. And then we would have a scion, who would also be in the tower for safety, sometimes on the ground because he likes to run around and get involved. Our scion is no sissy. Um, if I want to hire somebody else, I would need to start building into one of my other towers that I have created. The heroes and hireables are mobile. The hireables are restricted to a tower. They can only move two spaces. One, two, one, two, one, two spaces from the base of the tower or remain on top of it. Hireables on top of a tower are immune to melee damage because those swords and clubs can't reach them up there. It was a great way to keep your little clerics uh, safe. Okay. Heroes are not restricted to towers. They must start associated with the tower, and after that, they're free to run anywhere they want to. They can run all the way across the center of the board to go and tank at the very end. We'll talk about tanking in a moment. So, I'm going to select two heroes to start. I will choose Valcor the warrior and the unnamed Scion, he will be named soon by our Kickstarter backers. That's very exciting. Okay, now that we have set up and I've selected my starting heroes, which is a very interesting bit of the strategy, I should point out, because the combination of heroes that you choose will determine your strategy for the entire rest of the game. I have chosen a hands-on melee strategy that puts a lot of pressure on my main hero, Valcor. 
because Valcor is a very powerful defender who does a lot of offensive melee damage, but can't reach flying creatures. The Psionicist can reach flying creatures, but he's a, a largely a support character with the ability to teleport Valcor. So I'm going to use this combination to allow my Psionicist to put Valcor wherever on the map he needs to be. We'll see how that works in a little bit. Now that we've got these guys set up, let's um, start. To start, you begin with one tower for two players. So I'm going to be playing a two-player game solo, treating it like it's two players. I'm going to start with one tower. I can place it on any set of green, never on a road, and never on the border. I'm going to put it right here by the entrance because I'm that type of person. Let's get down and dirty right away. Okay. I'm going to assign Valcor to it right on the road. I'm going to assign the Psionicist to it right on the path, one, two spaces from the tower. I'm going to start with equipment cards. You receive two equipment cards per hero. I have the Pendant of Grace, which uh, grants equipped hero plus one healing rate. The Crystal of Focus, which you can see on the website, grants equipped hero two hit roll, and if worn by the Scion, the Scion's attack becomes auto. But these are assigned to Valcor. We'll have to deal with that later. We have the Phase Ring for the Scion, which would grant him plus two dodge, and the Nodachi, which is a Cyrus special, um, the Psionic Warrior, uh, that would grant a melee attack to a character who does not already have one, which would be a great piece of equipment for the Psionicist. Now, these pieces of equipment start locked. In order to unlock them, I'm going to have to pay 200 gold in between waves to unlock the equipment. Extra equipment can be bought. We'll talk about that when we get to between waves. Since I'm starting with the one tower scenario, I'm going to start also with 50 gold per hero. There's 100 right on the bottom, so that's 50 plus 50 is 100. Since it's the bottom card, I'm just going to leave it there. I'm not even going to bother to shuffle. Okay, so I have 100 gold that I can start with now. My options for 100 gold, I could buy another tower for 100 gold, or I could hire a foot soldier for 100 gold. Since I have a incredibly powerful Valcor standing right at the entrance, I think I'm going to save my 100 gold, and I'll run the gamut on this first round to see what we can get. We have our locked equipment on our selected heroes. We have a tower in place. We have our starting gold that we have chosen to not spend. Reinforcement cards are $200, so, so they are out of reach. Armory cards val vary in price based on the number of waves that you're playing. Shorter games, they're less expensive. Longer games, they're more expensive because you have more time to buy them. Um, they're a thousand gold. That's going to take me a while to get to. And the coin cards I only earn after defeating monsters. I'll collect that in between waves. So we're ready to begin wave one. I like my Scion Assist here because he's got a range of seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can reach all the way across that path with his Mind Blast. Towers do not block the line of sight, though I would have to walk around it or spend uh, an entire action to enter and an entire action to exit. It would be faster to just walk around. Now we're ready to start the first wave. Each wave begins with the foe's turn with them entering the board. Here we have our monster selection grid. We're working on a D12. For those of you who hate charts, we're working on a unique D12 that would be balanced for all waves. Um, for now, we're going to use the monster selection grid, which is the standard way to play the game. Don't be too intimidated by the chart. It works very quickly, actually. So we're going to take our D12. What I've rolled is a 1, which is very exciting. 1, wave 1, roll to 1, is a level 1 monster. I'm happy about that. We'll take the top level 1 monster, which is a Goblin Peon. The Goblin Peon is a 4 hit point creature that moves 5 spaces along the yellow arrows. Since I rolled an odd number, he'll enter on his right side. If I rolled an even number, he would enter on his left. Since he's going to enter on the odd side, five along the yellow squares. One, two, three, 
four, five. He'll bypass the red, get to the yellow, and follow along. I am going to let that goblin peon run away because there are going to be three monsters and I don't want Valcor to take too much damage early. I think that we'll be able to destroy him as he rounds that bend. Second monster. I rolled a four is another level one monster. Level one monster. Goblin Berserker. A bit stronger than the Goblin Peon. He's faster, uses the red arrows, and does way more damage. I am going to have to tank him because I don't want him to get too far. So he goes one, two. As soon as he is within any adjacent space to a hero or a hireable, at any time as a passive action, I have the opportunity to tank him, which basically means grab him by the scruff of the neck and say, you're not going anywhere anymore. So Valcor is going to grab the Goblin Berserker by the scruff of his neck, and the Goblin Berserker isn't a pretty fellow. And what we're going to do is, since um, he now entered, all monsters use the following rule. Upkeep, move, and then attack. The upkeep does not really apply on the first wave because I haven't put any bleed or stun or slow damage on them yet. So they enter with their movement. Now that they've stopped and in range, the goblin peon does melee damage to a range one. He's not going to be able to reach me. Now the goblin berserker, since I grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, is going to try to cut, me, cut my head off for it. So he's going to roll a d12 with his hit roll bonus of two. I rolled a four plus the two is a total of six. Valcor's dodge is 12. That's way under. Goblin Berserker misses. One more roll, because we have three monsters on wave one. We start simple, and I rolled a seven. We're going to pull in a level two monster. Level two monster, War Orc. Also on Ah. Now this is the interesting thing. Another way that the game can never be the same twice, beyond the map, um, always giving you new options because you can do a double route map or you can remove the splitter tiles and do a single route map. If you want a real challenge, go straight across out the exit or if you're playing with children or you want a real easy light game, you can snake the map all the way back and forth until you finally leave, giving you plenty of time to put the hurt down. Um, fun for an epic game if you play with seven or eight players and you're in for a really long game and you really want to just make it make a nice evening of it have a lot of fun order some pizza uh, increase the monster count because you're gonna have a million monsters running around I recommend a locker map so what we have here is the war orc who's been uh, notorious and famous in these parts he's gonna move five squares on the yellow one two three he would move up to where the Goblin Peon is. If two monsters are ever going to land on the same space with each other, they will bump back one. Monsters will not stack unless one of them is a flying creature, in which case he would be able to stack on top. We would rest them on top of each other. But I don't like the War Orc. I'm going to grab him by the scruff of the neck. Valcor is going to tank the War Orc. Valcor has a tank number of three, allowing him to tank a total of three monsters. I could have tanked the Goblin Peon also, but then he would have had a chance to attack me, like the War Orc does. Now the War Orc has an attack value of four. I rolled a 13 plus four is 17, which is well over my 12. So he deals three points of damage to me. Now the spinners, as I mentioned, will have a top dial, and a bottom dial. The top dial is going to have all of the art for the spinner, for the monster, and all of their statistics with a little cutout. The bottom dial is simply hit point numbers. So while spinning the top, you reveal the hit points on the bottom. As is, that uh, we're working with the beta prototype. So on the print and play, which is what you're looking at right now, um, the damage will be tracked by pencil. So my little hit point tracker box, I'm going to take three points of damage. Now each character has damage resistance. There are three types of damage. Melee damage, short range, usually adjacent characters, doesn't reach flying creatures, or allies and towers. 
sword and shield. Ranged damage has high range, low damage, can hit flying creatures, and can hit allies and towers, bows and arrows and crossbows, and supernatural damage, lightning bolts, fireballs. Moderate damage, sometimes hitting an area of effect, usually having a special effect such as fire or slow, and middle range, okay, can hit flying creatures and people in towers. So, damage resistance works the same way. There's melee, there's range, and there's supernatural. Since he did three melee damage to me, and I have a melee resistance of three, because I'm the super-powered tank, he's the only one with three, I'm going to reduce it three minus three to zero, but there is a minimum damage of one, so Valcor can always be, as we say, plinked to death. He will take a net one point of damage, and I'll record it right here on his print and play hero card. Um, as I mentioned before, all of the art is going to be upgraded. What you see for the tiles is the final art. Um, a slight color imbalance is because I printed it at home. The border art is very close to finish. There will be some final touches on that. The wave card will be beautiful, the equipment and other cards will be beautiful, and these will be beautifully designed as well. Um, you can see those on our website at gatekeepergaming.com. Okay, so um, we had three monsters enter. They've all moved. They've all had their chance to attack, if possible. Their turn is over. It is now the hero's turn. Heroes and players always take their turn in the order of their seating. So whoever is sitting closest in a clockwise fashion from the monsters in the entrance goes first. I have made that Valcor. My second player, I have made the Psionicist. Valcor will always go before the Psionicist. Valcor's team of hireables will always go before the Scion. So we're going to now have Valcor take his actions. Valcor is in range of two monsters at once. Um, melee is the only damage type that can that at range one can do diagonals. So at range one I can hit here, here, or here, but since it's melee I can hit diagonals also. The same rule applies for tanking. Tanking's always ranged one unless specifically there's an exception stated. So we're going to now have Valcor with his almost forgot my dice. With Valcor's special, unique, incredibly colorful D20 that matches his hero colors of gold and blue, I'm going to roll and I'm going to attack the Goblin Berserker. Now the Goblin Berserker has six hit points, I deal four, and I see that he has no damage resistance. So I'm going to attack him. I roll a one. Ah! Terrible way to start. Fortunately, it's only wave one. When you roll a natural one, it is an automatic fail, regardless of how high your hit roll bonuses are. If I roll a 1, and I was playing the Ranger with a 12 hit roll bonus for a total of 13, well above his defense dodge number, I still miss. If I roll a natural 20, sometimes a natural 17, 18, 19, or 20, depending on how it is outlined on your hero stat card, it is a crit, as is I roll a 1. Tears strolled it in my face. Now I rolled a 9. 9 plus my 8 is 17 for a total of, compared against his dodge number of 14. His dodge of 14, I managed to hit him for 4 points. We'll keep track right on his little card. He's got 2 hit points left. I could hit him and kill him, but my Scion deals 2 damage. So I'm going to work together with my other players in order to deal damage in the most efficient way possible. It's possible that my Scion could miss, but he's got three chances. Not going to happen. I have a third action for Valcor. All heroes have three actions, with the exception of the Ranger, whose special bonus is that he has four actions, and Asfar the Barbarian, who only has two actions, but puts out way enough damage to make up for it. So now we're going to take our other attack. I'm not going to attack the Goblin Berserker. I'm going to leave him alone. I'm going to attack the War Orc. I rolled an 8 plus 8 is 16. His dodge is 12. I hit him for 4 points. Oh no, he's got defense. Melee defense of 1 reduces my 4 down to 3. 
So he takes three points. Very simple. Valcor to one, two, three actions. There's no lollygagging. My turn's over. Scion, your turn. What do you want to do, buddy? Scion says, well, I like the idea of tag teaming that Goblin Berserker, and he's got no defense against Supernatural either, because he's a level one Goblin. So let me take him out. I'm going to roll a hit. I have a great hit roll of 10, because all I need to do is think about hitting you. So I rolled a 7, plus 10 is way over. 4 plus 2 is 6, so he is dead. We'll remove him the way the print and play works, nice and simple. Do a little eraser job. And whenever you kill a monster, you reset their hit points to full, and you put them at the bottom of their pile. Okay, now my Scion has two more actions. I am going to take one action to attack the War Orc with my own special purple Scion dice. I roll an 18, 18 hits. Now the War Orc has one melee damage, but no supernatural damage, so I still do my full two for a total of five damage. Now I could take one more attack, and I could even launch an attack on the Goblin Peon. But what I'm going to do is I am going to use one action to teleport Valcor, range six, one, two, three, four, A+. Plus. Move ally to any valid location. Higher bolts require a valid tower at location, cannot teleport himself, can be used out of turn, maximum of once per player turn. So I'm going to teleport Valcor over to here. So Valcor will be within a running range. Let's put him right here. So when he moves one, two, three, four, five, he won't be able to attack me. I'll move one, two, and I'll be able to bust him up. Okay? And then that's the end of my turn. Player's turn is over. When the last player takes all of his actions for his team, it goes right back to the foe's turn. Now, this is still wave one, so there are no more monsters being rolled. The monsters take their actions. The monster that is closest to the castle gate, according to the path, goes first. One, two, three, four, five. I tricked him. He's not in range. One, two, three, four, five. He's also stuck, not in range. They moved, they attacked if possible, and it was not possible because I outsmarted them. So now it is my turn. First player, Valcor. Valcor takes his actions. Valcor runs one, two, three, four, five, because his movement rate is five. For one action, you can move your full movement rate. Valcor is an offensive and defensive character, which means that if at all possible, he must seek out taking at least one attack per round. He's not allowed to just let the monsters run around and let the Scion do the damage at range. He needs to get involved because it's not his duty to sit around and be lazy. It's his duty to lead the troops. So there are some um, minor RPG elements, some thematic elements, that um, will force different characters to act in certain ways for the protection of the kingdom. So Valcor has to take an attack, which I want him to do anyway. So he's going to run up one action. He's got two left. I can take one attack on each. One hit on the Goblin Peon will kill him, so let's do that. Three plus eight is an eleven. His defense is ten. I'm not even going to record any damage because I killed him in one hit. We'll put him right on the bottom. The War Orc, I get one attack on him. Oh, and I have rolled a 20. 20 is a crit. Crits have a crit modifier, a damage multiplier. My damage multiplier is times two. So instead of four damage, I deal eight damage. And I have a special of one bleed on my damage, on my crits. So I'm going to deal eight damage to him minus his one resistance for seven. That's going to put him at... 12. Now this is enough to kill him, but let's show you bleed real fast. We'll take one of our bleed tokens, okay, which will be nice punch board, a good deal bigger than this. We're going to put it right on him. During his next upkeep, which is upkeep, move, then attack, during his upkeep he would take any bleeding damage, any burn damage. He would have bleeding, he would take one point, because he's got one bleed token on him, one point of bleeding damage at the start of his turn. But I killed him, so he doesn't have to worry about bleeding. So we do a quick reset. 
put them at the bottom. All the monsters are dead of wave one. We have been victorious. We move on to between waves.